Hi, welcome back to Complex Reaction Mechanisms and Kinetics in Physical Chemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about another technique for, for doing uh, complex reaction mechanisms and deriving rate laws, and it's called the pre-equilibrium approximation. Now, in the previous video, the stuff over here on the left side, Okay, this is what we did before, and that was using something called the steady state approximation. Okay, so all this stuff over here, steady state approximation. And we actually did steady state approximation for this reaction up here, and we derived a rate law. That's this, R. The rate of the reaction is equal to this expression, K1, K2 times the concentration of A times the concentration of B, divided by K minus 1 plus K2. All right? So this is... One, this is one sort of model or assumption that we're doing, okay? And like anything in, in chemistry, physics, whatever, there's different models to approximate different things. Steady state approximation is an approximation, okay? In reality, there's probably a lot more factors that go into determining a rate than just, you know, rearranging some stuff, doing some math, and so forth. But it's an approximation. Well, in this video, we're going to do this, the pre-equilibrium approximation, which assumes some different things. But let's look at the reaction right here and then talk about the assumptions and maybe do a little comparison. So what we have right here is we have A, which is our first reactant, reactant 1. We have B, which is our second reactant. And those are in equilibrium with our intermediate C. And like I talked about in the previous video, the intermediate is pretty much always this thing right here in the middle. Um, normally, the way it's set up is you have the first reaction goes to it, and then the second reaction gets rid of it and goes to a product. So that's what D is. D is our product. So the thing in the middle generally is your intermediate. Right? Um, it sort of takes some practice to recognize what it is. But remember, intermediates are short-lived. So can you measure the concentration of A? Yeah. Can you measure the concentration of B? Yeah. Can you measure the concentration of D? Yes. Can you measure the concentration of an intermediate? No, you really can't accurately do that because they're, they're by definition, intermediates are short-lived. And so unless you have a way to trap the intermediate, you really can't measure it. And generally for, for a lot of normal reactions that you do, you really can't measure it. So what you generally have to do is get what's called an expression for the intermediate. So I don't know, maybe it's something in the numerator divided by something in the denominator, but you need to get an expression for the intermediate. Okay, because you can't directly measure this. But if you can get the intermediate's concentration in terms of other things we know, like A, B, K1, K minus 1, K2, and D, then you don't even need to know the intermediate's concentration and we can deal with things from there. The steady state approximation assumes one thing, one major thing. And that's that the change in the intermediate's concentration with respect to time is zero. Okay. The closer the change of the intermediate over time is to zero, the more accurate the steady state approximation is. Okay, But in some reactions, maybe this isn't accurate. Maybe the change in intermediate is not zero. Maybe it's, it's higher than that. Okay, And it could be negative. It could be positive, but maybe it's not zero. So then maybe steady state approximation isn't exactly the most accurate method. Maybe we should choose something else. Okay. What we might want to do instead is maybe choose something different like the pre-equilibrium approximation. Pre-equilibrium approximation. So we're going to do that method and see how it differs from steady state approximation. Here's one important thing I just want to point your attention to because it can be very confusing. When I'm looking at this reaction over here, these k's, the k1, k minus 1, k2, those are rate constants. If you remember for rate constants, they're little k's, lowercase k's. In pre-equilibrium approximation, I have to make a really important distinction. I'm going to have to use rate constants, sure, but I also am going to have to use the equilibrium constant. Remember, a rate constant is the little k. The equilibrium constant is the big k. So generally, there's two ways you can denote this. You can either say, the, the, for the equilibrium constant, you can either just write k-eq, Although some people may prefer to put a big K and then just put a line over the top. And that means it's capital in, in this case, and so that's how I'm going to distinguish it ultimately. All right. 
So the thing about the pre-equilibrium approximation that's a little bit different than steady state approximation is in this first method over here, we assume the change in the intermediate concentration over time was zero, right? However, that's not an assumption that goes into the pre-equilibrium approximation. The, the assumption in the pre-equilibrium approximation is if you look at this first part of the reaction right there, just that part, okay? If you look at that, the assumption is that before any of this C, this intermediate gets converted to the product D, that A and B have already reached equilibrium with C. Okay, they're already in equilibrium. All right, what does that mean? Well, it means that when you're in equilibrium, you remember that the concentrations aren't necessarily equal on either side, but the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. That's an assumption, okay? Now, it's an approximation. Why? Because technically, it really can't always be at equilibrium. The reason is because this C is constantly being taken away and converted to the product D. So you can get pretty close to the pre-equilibrium, but it's in some cases, but it's not totally accurate. Again, that's why it's an approximation. But what we're going to assume is that A and B are in equilibrium with C before any of the C gets converted to D. Now, if this wasn't at equilibrium, what would I be using instead of K? I'd be using the reaction quotient, right? Q. That's not at equilibrium. However, because we're making the assumption that's equilibrium, I'm just going to use the equilibrium constant. Okay? Now let's actually go over the mechanics of how you do this type of problem. The first thing you have to remember is that the equilibrium constant is thermodynamic. Okay, rate constants are kinetic. And I know they always told you probably in Gen Chem that you can't specify rate or you can't specify kinetics from thermodynamics and you can't specify thermodynamics from kinetics. This right here is really, in terms of normal things you're gonna deal with, this is about the only connection that we have. And generally put, we say that the equilibrium constant, which is thermodynamic, is equal to the rate constant for the forward reaction divided by the rate constant for the reverse reaction. I can put that line over that too. This is really the only main um, connection between kinetics and thermodynamics because the equilibrium constant is the rate constant for the forward reaction divided by the rate constant for the reverse reaction. In this case, the forward reaction's rate constant was K1 and the reverse one was K minus one. One of the conventions also is for equilibrium reactions for rate constants. The reverse one is always given the negative value. The forward one is always given the positive value. That's just convention. You don't have to do that. But when you get in the, into the habit of a convention, it's really good to just keep the convention. Also, think back to your thermodynamics from, uh, from probably physical chemistry one. What's another expression for the equilibrium constant? Well, it's, if you remember, the product of all of the concentrations of the products divided by the product of all the concentration of the reactants, okay? This right here is a physical chemistry term. The, the uppercase pi just means product, meaning you multiply the concentrations of the products divided by the, you, the, you multiply the concentrations of the reactants. So in this case, the reaction was A plus B is in equilibrium with C. So that's why I have for the products concentration of C in the denominator, the concentration of the reactants are A times B. So what I've done is I've said that the equilibrium constant is not only equal to K1 over K minus one, it's equal to the concentration of C divided by the concentrations, the product of the concentrations A and B. And that is sort of a fundamental expression that I actually have here. And that's what I'm actually going to deal with for pre-equilibrium approximation. Now, one similarity between this method and the steady state approximation, remember in the steady state approximation, I wanted to solve for the intermediate, which was C, same thing here. Why do I always wanna solve for the concentration of the intermediate? Because I can't measure the intermediate, but if I can get it in terms of other things that I know, such as K1, K minus one, a, B, and so forth, then I don't need to know its concentration. I can put it in terms of everything else. So this is what I'm gonna do. 
On both sides of this expression, I'm going to multiply times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. So let's do that. Concentration of A on this side times the concentration of B. That cancels this over there. So now I have the concentration of C, which, remember, this is really just the intermediate, is equal to K1 over K minus 1 times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. Now, another similarity to the steady state approximation, remember what I did for the last step? I want to find the rate of the overall reaction. Remember, for this particular uh, setup, the rate is just this last part over here. It's the conversion of the intermediate to the product D. So I said over here, well, that's just the change in D with respect to time, and I just called that the rate, right? So that's the same thing over here. The rate is just the change in d with respect to time, the derivative. However, it's the same thing as before, right? It's just the concentration of c times k2, the rate constant. It's pretty handy because I just figured out an expression for c, the intermediate. It's this. It's this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug that in for c, because that's what c is equal to, right? And ultimately what I get is the rate of this reaction by pre-equilibrium approximation is K2 times K1 over K minus 1 times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. All right, so let me get both of these in the same screen. All right, so this one we just did was by the pre-equilibrium approximation. The first one was by the steady state approximation. So there's one really important thing that I want you to recognize, okay? Is there a difference between the rate expressions that we derived? Okay. Well, in the numerator, let's see, I have k1, k2, I have that there, I have a and b, okay? But notice the denominator. By steady state approximation, I have k minus 1 plus k2. In the denominator by pre-equilibrium approximation, I don't, I don't have the plus k2, I only have the k minus 1. Okay, this is a really important thing to notice, and it's often a source of confusion. Sometimes on exams, particularly ones that are written exams, they'll say, here's, here's, a, here's a, a reaction or set of reactions. Derive the rate law through steady state approximation. You're like, okay, I got this. I know steady state approximation. I got the rate law. Then they'll have a follow-up question. Now derive it using pre-equilibrium approximation. You're on the test. You're stressed already, you get two different answers. These are two different answers, right? That doesn't mean you did it wrong, okay? Remember, these are not, these are not actually experimental, okay? Now, if you're doing it experimentally, you'd want to get the same thing, hopefully. If you did two experiments, you'd want to get the same rate for both of them. These are derivations, okay? The, the answer to the derivation that you get, that you do, is dependent on the assumptions that go in. So if the assumptions are different, then the expression from the, that comes out of the derivation will be different as well, probably. So you, whenever you do steady state approximation, it's very, very common to get a sum of rate constants in the denominator. Just telling you from experience, that's very common for steady state approximation. If you didn't get a sum of rate constants in the denominator, it's not necessarily wrong, but for normal uh, things you're doing, you may want to go back and just check to make sure you did it right. For pre-equilibrium approximation, it's actually more common to get one little term here in the denominator. So like k minus 1. It's more common to get that. If you got a sum, or if you didn't get anything at all, that's another sign you may want to go back and see if you did it right. So for steady state approximation, you tend to get this sum more often than not. And for pre-equilibrium approximation, you get this one term in the denominator. Other than that, though, normally the expressions that you get for the rate law are very, very similar. And that's something that's really important to realize. Okay. Now, which one is actually a more accurate method? Okay. Well, just remember, you know A and B. You can know those. And there are ways you can figure out the rate constants, okay? In other words, k minus 1, k1, k2, they're all known, basically, or can be known. So how do you determine which method is more accurate? Well, you actually conduct the experiment under those conditions, and you measure the rate. 
whichever experimental rate, or whichever one of these equations, these rates, whichever one have a value that's closer to the experimental rate, and that's probably the assumption that's more close to being correct, okay? In other words, let's say, I'm just gonna use arbitrary. Let's say this rate, I don't know, was, I don't know, 10. And let's say the rate that you got out of pre-equilibrium approximation was, I don't know, eight. Let's suppose the experimental, oops, the experimental rate, and again, I'm not putting units, but I'm just trying to illustrate the point. Let's say the experimental rate was 9.97. Which one of these methods was a more valid assumption? Well, the more valid assumption was therefore a steady state approximation, right? Let's say you do another, a completely different experiment. So different setup, maybe these same rates that were derived. Let's say your, your rate was more like 7.94. Then pre-equilibrium approximation was probably more, the more valid method. Assuming you did, did enough replicates and took an average and low standard deviation and so forth. Okay, so that's how you generally determine rates. Okay, is and that's why mechanisms are important. When you did organic chemistry, you talked about mechanisms more in the sense of arrow pushing, but in in a physics or kinetic sense, the mechanism is just the is the way the reaction proceeds. Okay, it could be saying is it zeroth order, first order, second order. Okay, those are ways of thinking about it. If you determine a rate law, so like one of these R's, if you determine a rate law assuming it's zero order, you determine a rate law for first order, and you determine a rate law for second order, all for the same reaction, how do you determine if it's zero order, first order, or second order? You just measure the experimental rate, and if it's say closest to first order, then that's probably what it is. Okay, it wouldn't be second order because the experimental rate is not even close to the um, derived rate from second order. Okay, we'll do another, a more, a, a clear example of that in another video. But the whole point here is just to get a grasp on the mechanics of steady state approximation versus pre-equilibrium approximation. So in the next few videos, we're going to do a little more with these methods. We're going to, we're going to really hit them hard. We're going to do examples, and then hopefully by then you'll have a grasp on it, and then we'll move more into specific examples of complex reaction mechanisms like the Lindemann mechanism and so forth and you'll see that you're going to have to use a combination of both these methods to get expressions for those reactions. All right so hopefully this video helped. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.